Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the students and teachers joining us from all over Australia today. My name's Janine Kelly, and I work in the education team at the ACTF. I'm speaking today from the traditional lands of the Eastern Ma people. I'd like to begin by paying my respect to the traditional owners of this land, past and present, um, and the elders uh, of people from the lands that you're all meeting from as well. The ACTF is very pleased to be presenting today's webinar in partnership with ACME Education and ABC Education. We are all passionate about how great stories on screen can educate, entertain, and inspire audiences of all ages. Today, we're here to talk about My Place, one of my favorite Australian stories. This fantastic book and TV series tell the history of an Australian community through the eyes of the children who live there. My Place shows us how some things change in our communities over time, while some things stay the same. We're thrilled to have author Nadia Wheatley here to talk about her book, My Place, and to share some tips with you young writers who are watching today. First, we'll hear from Nadia, and then Annabelle from uh, ABC Education will ask Nadia some questions. And towards the end, we'll have some time for some student questions as well. Nadia, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Janine. It's wonderful to be here. Wonderful to be here with all of you. So hello, everyone, this morning, wherever you are. Or it might even be afternoon in some places, wherever you are across Australia. We're going to be sharing ideas. Uh, but before we begin, we're going to acknowledge country wherever we are in Australia. So I'm going to be showing a little slideshow and we'll begin with our first slide which is the slide for the acknowledgement of country. I'm in Sydney in the inner west, and so I am on the land of the Gadigal clan in the land of the Eora nation. But you'll be in other Aboriginal country, wherever you are, or Torres Strait Islander country. Wherever we are, we're very thankful to be on Aboriginal land. So just as when we go to someone's house and we say thank you for having us, we'd like to acknowledge country and show that respect and that gratitude. The words on your screen are words that were written by a group of children that I worked with in a project here in Sydney some years ago, a culturally diverse group of children. And in the picture on your screen, which is by artist Ken Searle, we can see children sitting down and two strips of very different Australian country above and below them. I can't hear you, but you can hear me and you can hear each other. So let's together say the words of the acknowledgement. And as you do it, think about the name of the Aboriginal people whose country it is where you live. We acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we live and learn. We pay respects to their elders, past and present, and we thank them for taking care of country over countless generations. As well as being a respectful way to begin, it gives us our opening because everything we're going to be talking about today connects with country or it connects with place. Next slide. So that place word is my favourite word actually in the English language and is, is of course in the title of the book My Place and in the title of the TV series. So there you can see the book cover. And we're going to come back in a few minutes and look at that cover in more detail. And you can also see a publicity poster for the first series of the television series of My Place. So I hope that maybe you've had a few minutes before we start to look at those. But if you haven't, there'll be plenty of time in your classrooms later to read the book 
and to look at some of the episodes. Next. I've been talking to children and teachers and grown-ups about my place for over 30 years. And the first question people always ask is where did you get the idea for the book? So that's what we're going to start with today. I've got four pictures there that help me answer the question. Up at the very top, you'll see an energetic black dog. He was actually a very big dog. And like all dogs and like all people, he needed exercise. When he was young, he was a bit silly. He used to run out onto the road. So I used to have to find safe places to take him for a run. From Monday to Friday in the afternoon, I used to go to a graveyard that was near my place, a graveyard, a very old cemetery with a big stone wall around it. And I could let him off the lead and let him run there for half an hour or an hour. And I could be sure he couldn't get out onto the road and get run over. While he was running, I used to sit in on the roots of a big tree that was there. You can see the tree in the picture below my dog. So the tree is an Australian fig tree. And the way it grows with these big roots makes a comfy place to sit and have a think. And as I was thinking, I used to imagine generations of Australian children from Aboriginal time right through to the present playing in that tree, maybe building forts or having swings or just going there when they were happy or when they were sad. On Sundays and Saturdays, I had a bit more time. So I used to set off with my dog in the morning and we'd go a long walk, a few kilometres across the suburb. And I've got a photo of one of my favourite streets we used to go down. And you can see there's a lot of old houses. There's some warehouses there in the street. But most importantly, you can see it's sloping. And we're going to be talking later about the importance of being aware of whether a street is going downhill or uphill, because that shows us how water moves. From that sloping street, I know when it rains, the water will run downhill and it runs down to that canal that you can see at the bottom of your screen. Now, a canal is just a fancy word for a creek or a river that's been enclosed to make it run more straight and more deeply. So beside that canal, there were old warehouses and fan factories. You can see it's a bit grubby, the water, but there were fences too, and I could go through the fence. If you find a fence, you'll probably find a hole in it somewhere. I could go through the fence with my dog and let him off. And again, safely without roads, he could run up and down. As he ran up and down beside that canal, I became aware that the movement of the water was going in one way. And I realised it was running down towards a tidal river, a river that goes in and out to the sea. As I realised that the canal water was fresh, I realised that Aboriginal people would have camped beside that river, beside that creek or canal, that waterway, for thousands of years. Because water is very heavy to carry. Just fill up a bucket and try to carry it and you'll see it's heavy and it's difficult. It splashes about. And so Aboriginal people sensibly like to camp near fresh water. They walked all over the country. They had different traditional lands that didn't have water on them, but the places to build their mura, their little homes or shelters, would be convenient to the fresh water. When the first people started to come from overseas, they also went straight for the fresh water because they wanted it for their homes, for their crops, and also, sad to say, for their factories, which began to pollute those waterways. So the first key to understanding history is to find where the fresh water is and then you'll know where people have made their homes and communities. Next. So again we have this tree and it's the same tree that I've shown you, the tree in the graveyard and you've got a photo of it taken by me and you have the photo of the poster of my place. And so what I wanted to show you was, it is a real tree, it is a real place. I make makeup stories, but I get them from real things around me. And this tree is very close to where I live now on Cadigal land. And the real tree was used in the first series of the television series. Next. 
the first thing I do, whether I want to um, write a story for grown-ups or a story for children, a story of history or a made-up story, the first thing I do is clear my brain of any ideas, get out my coloured pencils and do a little map. As I'm walking around exploring, I'm making little maps in my head. And when I put them down, I'm just looking for a few basic elements. So this is the map of the real country that inspired my place. You can see a shape that looks a bit like that sea creature called a stingray, a sort of a shape a bit like a heart maybe even, and running upwards, inwards from it, you have a tidal river, a salty river, and then can you see a little blue line on which I've written fresh water, and then there's some little hoops, little brown hoops like half donuts above them, and they're the Ngura, the little homes that the Aboriginal people lived in. Up above that there's a track, a walking track along the top of the hill because it's good to walk along a ridge, you don't have to keep going up and down, and there's a green splodge for the fig tree. But I want to draw your eye also to a little blue line at the bottom of the map that doesn't have any writing on it and we'll talk about that special blue line a little bit later. So that map has everything I need in it for the idea for my place. We've got fresh water, we've got food that's gonna come out of the tidal river and out of the land. We've got a good way to walk along the land. And we've got this fig tree, which symbolizes life, but the fig tree's got fruit on it as well. So fruit for people and fruit for birds and possums. Next one. One night, a long time ago, there was nothing on television. So I lay on the couch with my beloved dog and I got out an exercise book, so not my coloured pencils this time, just a lead pencil and a biro. And I started again to doodle. I doodled a little map, not of the whole country, but just of the street. I put an Aboriginal flag up in the top and I wrote the year that was coming up then. And I, as I was doing this map, words came into my mind. Someone spoke to me almost and she said, my name's Laura, this is my place. My house is the one with a flag on the window. So instantly the people, the characters of the place came into my mind when I was doing the place. And once I've got people interacting with place, I start to get that other element of story that we call the plot. The plot is the bit of the narrative that tells you what is happening in it. Next. So it was important when I got that first idea that I knew it was going to move in a circle. And behind me today, we can see a beautiful Aboriginal painting um, done by a woman called Nakamara, who was living in the community of Papunya, where I worked for some time. And you can see the circles in that painting. And often in Aboriginal art, you'll find those circles, those concentric circles, circles inside circles. And they can symbolize homes, they can symbolise water holes, they can symbolise campfires. And if you think of fire and water, you realise why we have those where we have homes. So it was important when I wrote my place and when the TV people made the TV show of my place that we began and we ended with Aboriginal storytellers, First Nations storytellers. And I think of them putting like a big hug, a big circle, around the story of my place with the beginning and the end that join up. Next. So here we have the first double page of my place. We call it the first spread because it spreads open. And these are these words that I got on that Sunday night when I got the idea. My name's Laura and this is my place. Our house is the one with the flag on the window. And I bet that there's not a single one of you who does not know what that flag is and why it is so important. Laura tells us about her pet, who's a dog. She draws a map of her place and she tells us about her birthday party under the big tree. Next. And here we have not the last spread, but the second last spread. And remember I was saying the Aboriginal storytellers embrace the story. So Laura is Aboriginal on the first page and in the first episode of the TV series. And at the end, we have another Aboriginal girl called Barangaroo. And she says, my name's Barangaroo. I belong to this place. She's also got a pet, which is a puppy dog, a bit like 
Laura's puppy dog. She has a party with her family and her clan down on the bay. She does her map, which is probably a bit bigger than anyone else's map in the book. And she talks about her family. And she says, we're staying here for the summer at the creek camp to get the fish down in the bay. But often we stay a while at other places. Everywhere we go is home. Next. So let's look again at that cover. What does the cover tell us? It's, I didn't do the pictures in the book and I certainly didn't do the cover. The illustrator of the book is Donna Rawlins. And I always remember how when we were doing the book, we were living in very different parts of Australia. And in those days, we didn't have the internet. We couldn't send emails. We couldn't send pictures as attachments or photos. We had to ring each other up on a funny old thing called a landline, which was fixed to the wall. So one night I'd gone to bed and the phone rang at about three in the morning and I woke up. And when the phone rings, when you're asleep, sometimes you get a fright and you think something's terrible's happened. So I raced to the phone and answered it and it was Donna and she was screaming down the phone and I thought something awful had happened. And she said, I ripped the cover. And I knew she was working very, very hard to get the work done in time. And I thought accidentally she'd ripped the beautiful art paper of the cover, but she was ringing me and screeching in excitement because her idea was so wonderful, and it was, that she ripped that beautiful art paper. And if you see the white line in the cover picture, you can see where it's been ripped, the thick paper. And it was her way of deciding how to show the built environment, the modern houses on the top and the Aboriginal land down below. So it's what we call a metaphor. It's an idea that carries other ideas across. And it's a metaphor here for ripping back or peeling back layers of history to show that wherever we are, we're walking on Aboriginal land and also to show that history is made by all of us and history is made now. It's not something made in the past. Next. So just have a quick close look at the maps in my place because they all change. We're talking about continuity and change today. So they all change, but they have certain elements of continuity. One bit of continuity, continuity means things that keep on going the same. One element of continuity is that we always have the tree at the top and we have a waterway at the bottom. It might be a canal or it might be the original creek. So we have those two things and then in the middle, we've always got home. We see public buildings, shops, factories, parks, but we also see the nature of the community changing. So when you're looking at the maps in the book, look at the little writing, look at the grocery shops and the restaurants, look at the sporting fields, see how things change while some things remain the same. Next. Wherever you are, you're always walking on Aboriginal land. So I put these two pictures in. We've got actors from the TV series. Um, we've got in the modern day, um, a friend of mine acted as Auntie Bev. Her name is Bronwyn Penrith, a wonderful elder who runs a women's centre, an Aboriginal women's centre here in Sydney. And a young girl, she's a very tall young girl, but she's only about 12 or 13, um, who played the part of Laura. And then we have a couple of other actors showing time, deep time, we call it in the TV series, time that goes back before non-Indigenous people started to come to the land. But can you see the continuity in the land and also the changes that happen in the land? Even when it's the city, people are still walking on Aboriginal land. Next one. So here we have the timeline that's in the book, My Place. And look at those circles going round and round and they're directly inspired by these kinds of ideas that we get in Aboriginal art that show continuity, that show time flowing all the way back, 60,000 years or more. If we look at that timeline, we see a lot of things staying the same, but we also see evidence of change, changes in transport, we see changes in housing styles. We see changes in history. And one of the big changes is that one that happens um, in 1998 when we get 
court judgments acknowledging that Aboriginal people are the traditional owners of country. Next one. Okay, this is the last spread in the book and it's going to be the last spread in our PowerPoint. And this one really sums up the ideas of continuity, but also a little bit of change. So on the last page, we suddenly changed the way we've had these busy, busy pages all through my place with maps and parties and pets and all these things going on. Suddenly we just close it down quietly. It's the end of the day and Baron Guru is sitting by herself up the tree and suddenly we have direct speaking. We have quote marks to show that someone's speaking. It's going to be Baron Guru and her grandmother speaking. And she says, my grandmother says we've always belonged to this place. But how long, I ask, and how far, my grandmother says, forever and ever. So we can see the land running out to the west where the sunset is. We see the sea over in the east where the sun will rise again in the next morning. And most significantly, we look at the colours of the land and the colours of the page to remind us of the colours of the Aboriginal flag so that the book also goes round in a circle from the tiny flag on the cover, the slightly bigger flag on Laura's page, and then we come back to this huge big flag on Barangaroo's page. Okay, that's the end, I think, of our slides. Thank you so much, Nadia. That's, I always learn something new each time. And I had forgotten about the, the cover of the book. And so it was really wonderful to hear that story. And welcome to everybody who's uh, watching today and joining us online from all around the country. Um, my name is Annabelle. I'm from ABC Education. And I'm going to, I do have a couple of questions for Nadia, but we really want to hear the questions from you out there and some of the work that you've been doing or particular questions that you have for Nadia around change and continuity in my place. Um, so we'll get started in a moment, but I do just have one question to start off with um, Nadia. And that is that around my place and being sit, set in a Sydney neighbourhood. It was your neighbourhood that you grew up in. But amazing stories can be told about all neighbourhoods or wherever we live um, on this land. So what are some great ways to create a unique sense of place when writing? Well, firstly, yes, of course, my place, because I lived here, I had to write about something specific and it was that tree and that waterway that gave me the idea. But since the book's been published, which is over 30 years, I've workshopped it with children in Alice Springs and Broome and Darwin and Launceston and all over this land. But even more amazingly, I've actually received my place stories done by children in America. Um, so the actual place translates to anywhere in the world. But wherever you are, you can go through exactly the same process. So I always encourage people to do their first research outdoors in the country, using that word as Aboriginal people do to mean the land where you are and to look and to use your eyes and ears and nose, but also use your feet to teach you because your feet will tell you whether you're going up or down. They'll tell you the way the water is going to run. As you're looking, make little maps in your head. And then when you go home, get out your colored pencils. Don't worry about your first sentence. Don't worry about who's in the story or what it's about. Draw a very simplified map that gives you the shape don't use Google Maps. That's going to be a trap. Google Maps are great to get to a new place, but they're not good for a place you know. You want to just have the basics of the place. Once you have um, the beginning of a map, write into it like the children in my place do. So don't just write post office or school. Write, this is my school. I like to go there because, or my best friend is called. Um, write actual sentences into the map. And you will find those sentences give you the characters, like I did with my name's Laura, this is my place. And I went, oops, who are you, Laura? And they will also, once you've got the characters there, you'll get the story without trying to get it. 
Okay, that's great, Nadia. We've got so many questions coming in, so we'll get straight into it. So um, somebody from Thorpedale Primary has asked um, about how long ago was um, My Place published? And maybe also tell us a little bit, little bit about how you got started writing yourself. Okay, so My Place was, I'm afraid, published before any of you were born. And it might have even been published before some people's parents were born. So it was published about 33 years ago. I think I have to keep adding years on. Um, but it seems to be as relevant today. People still seem to be wanting to read it. It doesn't seem to have gone out of date. I began writing stories when I was five years old. Now, I don't say that to make you feel that you can't do things. I wrote stories in the most simple little way, but what was important was that I love stories. My mother read me lots of stories and she told me lots of stories, true stories about her childhood and stories about what she'd done in the war. And I just loved stories so much I wanted to be inside stories. And the best way was to write them down. So when I was about five, I said to her, I'm going to be a writer when I grow up. And she said, if you want to do that, you will. And so I was. That's great. Well, we've had lots of questions I can see coming in the chat, like um, um, some people from um, Wong, um, Wong Garbon Public School and um, some schools in Warrnambool have asked about, you know, where you get your inspiration from. And I think that you've really sort of covered that there. And just a note on like about when it was published in 1988, I was in year 10 at school. And even just seeing that open spread, it just reminded me of being in year 10 at school. And that was a, a year of bike centenary so my experiences and the changes and continuities that I've seen are also going to be different to everybody who's um, participating here and that's I think such a wonderful reminder and legacy of the book okay we've got a question uh, from Maury East Public School and they're asking will you be writing any more new books look I'm always writing more new books but in recent years, I've been writing more books for grown-ups than for children. So I should write another book for children soon. But um, I was thinking I might quickly show you a different book, which is called um, Going Bush. So I'm going to wave it in front of the screen. Because remember when I showed you the map and I showed you, I said there was another little blue line on the map. So like a twin creek for the My Place Creek is a real creek in Sydney called the Walleye Creek. It's got an Aboriginal name. And with a group of culturally diverse children, quite some time ago, I did. I went on a bushwalk and we did exactly the kind of thing I'm suggesting to you today. We looked around us, we learned about the history and the place around us, and we did our own book. And so I'm trying to encourage you to um, do what we did in that way to get out there, to get out into the country and to do your writing um, from that. And maybe I'll just read you, because people often want to think about different ways to write a story. Does it always have to be a narrative? So this is a very quick, short poem. One of the boys, a year four boy on that excursion wrote. He's writing about the type of tree called a casuarina that we sometimes call a she oak that grows behind beside the waterway. He wrote, Beside the creek, casuarinas standing high, brown and mighty, big roots grip the ground, searching deep for water in this horrible drought. So your poem doesn't have to rhyme, but that's a perfect little description writing about place. So that might be the size and shape of something that you might write. Great. Um, from grade three at Seaforth Primary School, um, they've asked a great question. Why, why did you add the timeline to the 20th anniversary edition? Because I could. Because we started to be able to have some extra pages in a book. There's mathematical reasons why um, books have certain numbers of pages. But when we freed up some extra pages for that edition, I'd done a um, timeline when I'd worked with an Aboriginal um, community doing another book called... Um, the Papunya School Book of Country and History. And in that book, we'd done a huge timeline that opens out in three pages. But it was a timeline. I won't hold it up to the screen because you won't be able to see it properly. But it incorporates that circular 
continuity idea from Aboriginal history. And that was actually working with an Aboriginal school. And so when the opportunity came for the new edition, I decided I worked with Donna again, and we got the shape from the Papunya timeline and incorporated that flowing sense into the new edition of the book, just as a way of summarising the continuity and the change that goes on through the book. Yeah. And I guess one um, a different aspect of um, continuity and change is about having the book turned into a TV series. So we've got lots of questions coming in about that. But um, so Chelsea asked, how, how did you feel about when My Place was turned into a TV series? Oh, look, it was extremely exciting. I got to work on it a bit, which is unusual um, for a writer. I didn't work on the scripts, on the stories, um, but I was allowed to be a consultant, so to um, help advise people with the history. And I got to go to quite a lot of the um, shoots of the first series, but I was particularly there on the day when they took that photograph you've seen a couple of times now, um, the photograph of the children from the first series, all in character, all in costume in the tree. And I was moved to tears because remember I said, I used to sit on the roots of that tree with my dog and imagine children playing in the tree. And it was as if it had all come to life. And of course, most of you with your stories won't get the chance to have a TV series made of them because it's very rare even for grown-up writers for that to happen. But that is exactly what happens when you imagine and write a story. Your imagination comes to life. So at whatever level you do it, keep going doing it and you will bring your characters to life. And, and about characters, uh, I, I think this is a, a fairly sort of tricky question. It's almost like asking, do you, do you have um, a favourite child? But um, from St ben Bernard's in Berowa, they, they're asking, who is your favourite character in my place? Oh, that's not a tricky question. Well, it's <laughs> for you. It has to be Laura and Baron Guru. So they are twin characters. So it's those two characters who embrace the story, who have the top and the tale of the story. Yeah. Okay. And we've got lots of questions about, um, you know, we've had questions about um, how you get inspired to be a writer, but we've, um, Doncaster Primary and Blacktown North Public School um, have asked, well, how long did it actually take to create the, the book? Okay. So from getting that first idea and sending it off to Donna was only four days because that idea, initial idea, came very, very quickly and I got the whole shape. But of course, in a book like this, there's a lot of research. So Donna and I worked um, flat out seven days a week and often till three or four in the morning um, for 18 months, that's a year and a half. But it would normally, I would think a book like this would take about three years to do. So there was a lot of research to be done in libraries and a lot of um, research for Donna to do also about transport and about characters, costumes and architectural styles. And of course, for the TV series, again, a lot of research had to be done to get all those things right. So the book was a collaborative process, but even more so, the TV series was a huge collaborative process with lots of people involved. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Templeton Primary have asked, when did you become passionate about changes in the environment? Oh, that's a great question. Um, my generation wasn't as aware of environmental issues as the generation of today. But I think that from when I started living in the particular area I live, which is the area of my place, I was aware, um, for instance, with that waterway, with that canal, um, that a lot of pollution was going on in that creek. So I became aware of it at that time. Interestingly, I have seen things getting better as well as some things getting worse. So obviously on a global level, on a big picture level, things are getting worse and we've all got to work very, very hard, whether we're just an eight-year-old or whether we're the head of a government, we've got to work very, very hard to make things better. But sometimes because of community action, we can see water improving, we can see parks improving and by all getting together. So I've been very involved in community groups in my area, um, planting trees, planting 
native plants, indigenous plants, and cleaning up the water. So we can make change. We can make things improve, um, and we can lobby governments and local councils um, to stop things getting worse. It's um, just even your response to that question, Nadia, really touches on changes and continuities as well, just in, in, the, in the world around us. And uh, I know the students who are reading and, and, and listening here today, that they're going to be aware of all those changes and continuities as, you know, that as they, they grow up and as they become older, and certainly for the teachers who are watching as well. I love this question from Glenory Public School, and they've, they've just observed that on the last page, the sun setting looks like the Aboriginal flag, and they want to know, was this intentional? Yes, it was intentional. So um, the Aboriginal flag actually came into being during my lifetime. So when I was your age, um, there wasn't an Aboriginal flag. It began, um, it was created, designed in 1972, which is a very, very important year in Aboriginal history. It's the year when um, a group of Aboriginal people went down to Canberra and set up the Aboriginal Embassy, sometimes known as the Tent Embassy. And I had friends down there and actually went down there myself while that was on. And it was that same year um, that the Aboriginal flag was developed. And the book came um, about 15 years later. So that flag was well known to me. And when I gave Donna the first version of the book, which was still just done in pencil, four days after the idea, I said, I wrote a little note saying, could you please make the colours of the page look like the Aboriginal flag? We've also had um, a couple of questions relating to the idea of the timeline. And one school has asked, um, what gave you the idea of structuring it along a timeline? And um, the students at Corumban State School in the Gold Coast have asked, well, what's your favourite timeline or your most entertaining timeline to work on? Oh, well, the best timeline I've ever worked on was the timeline in the Papunya School Book. And so that was done over a number of weeks, working with students at a school that was completely Aboriginal students, um, people who spoke five different Aboriginal languages. And we did a big timeline um, of their history and did it as what we called a print walk. So it was on great big posters. It was along the school and you could walk along it. But you can do that at your school. You can make a timeline in um, half an hour, go out into the playground, get a long piece of rope or just a piece of chalk and mark it along for the decades, for the 10 year slots since non-Aboriginal people have come to the land and then take it right long, maybe in a big swirl going all the way out of the school grounds for the very, very long time of Aboriginal history. I'm not very good at mathematics and I have to see things. I like geometry, but I wasn't any good at arithmetic. And so if I do a timeline, I can visualize the length of time. When I got the idea for my place, and this is something I maybe skipped over a bit in the, um, in the PowerPoint because we couldn't look at every page. When I got um, Laura's page at the beginning, and we might talk about why it goes backwards. When I got Laura's page at the beginning, I knew that we would turn the page and there'd be a non-Aboriginal narrator for the next page in the same house, but with a different family. And then we'd have turn the page and have someone else. And I wanted to show the long period of cultural diversity that's been part of Australian history, whether people coming from England or Ireland or China or America or Germany or Greece or all sorts of countries. And some of them we see in the shops at the top. We don't have actual stories about them. I wanted to show that in between this embrace of Laura and Barangaroo. And it was convenient to have these 10 year slots that we call decades and to count them back. I could fit that shape into a book. And so the book always was a timeline, whether or not there was actually one on the page. It was only when we did that new edition that I was actually able to just have some fun by making that timeline very, very clear. Yeah, obviously the, the environment, the built and natural environment is very important for you to get inspiration. And somebody has asked, do you also travel to help you get ideas? I do travel to get ideas, but um, 
East West Homes Best for getting ideas. So um, I'm really very, I've, I've written four books about this area where I live, also a book for people your age called Five Times Dizzy, a young adult book called The House That Was Eureka, um, and then the sequel to Five Times Dizzy. So four books have come out of this tiny little suburb where I live. And I could, if I had time, write 40 more books um, based on this area. And of course, the um, Going Bush book is also in this area. So travel's great. I've recently just been to an island in Greece and my brain is buzzing with it. Um, but I like to walk around my place and look at the changes. And just one way you can do it, walk down your shopping street mm -hmm. and see above the shops, probably, you'll see older street signs, you'll see a butcher's shop used to be a real estate agent or vice versa. But even the houses in your street, even if you're living in a relatively new housing estate, you'll see changes that come. Someone comes in and they plant a gum tree. Someone else comes in and they plant a hydrangea. That's a blue flowering sort of exotic plant. So you'll see the changes all around you every day. And it's just a matter of being mindful and seeing what they tell us about the people. Uh, we've got a, um, we've only got a few minutes left and we've just got so many great questions and um, we're really sorry for everybody that we can't get to all of them. But um, just a couple of last questions and that's, I guess, going on from the, from your last answer, C fourth primary have asked, would, would you ever write a sequel to my place? No, I think the book is the sequel or maybe the TV series was the sequel. No, I think it's a thing in itself. But it doesn't mean you can't write the sequel. In fact, children around Australia have been writing their own sequels to it um, for 33 or 35 years now. Yeah. And I love this question. I think this is a quite a personal question. Um, so do you still visit the fig tree? And if so, how does visiting it make you feel now? Mm. I do visit the fig tree and if you go to my website and then go up to the news page you'll see a photo of me just last winter actually um, at the fig tree one afternoon it was a beautiful sunset and I was wearing a ready purpley type of a top that matched the sunset so yes you can see me at the fig tree in on my website I often go there possibly once a week or once a fortnight it, it's only 10 minutes or so walk away from my place and it's a lovely still quiet place to be in yeah and um just as um you described sort of that the hug that we've got at the beginning and and the end with Laura and Barangaroo I think this question sort of is is a nice hug for the way that we've actually started off this by acknowledging country and um C4 Primary again have, have asked what, why was it important to include Indigenous perspectives in your book? Well, I don't think we can do anything in Australia without including Indigenous perspectives because wherever we are, whoever we are, whatever we think, whatever we believe, we are always walking on Aboriginal land. And that is a great thing to share. It's not something um, to make us feel unwelcome. It's a thing that gives us a sense of this country in a capital C, meaning the land um, that is below our feet, that we're not just living up in our brains, we're actually planted, our feet are planted like the roots of a tree onto this land and it is where we all are. So we have to acknowledge that an Aboriginal perspective is different from mine because I'm not an Aboriginal person. Um, we have to acknowledge that Aboriginal history, which is the oldest living country, oldest living culture, and what a privilege it is to be living here where the sense of history is so long and so rich and so continuous behind us. Yeah. And that, that's just, I think, just the perfect place to end, Nadia, especially when I'm looking at all of the questions and just the variety of places across Australia as a nation and knowing that we are part of, um, of a place in time and a place where we do have the longest continuous living uh, like, um, 
history um, within the world. Um, and I look at some of the places like we've got um, Mulgoa Public School, we've got some um, Bernards in Berawa, so many um, people from around the country from Glenory Public as well. So um, I think that's just a perfect um, reminder. So um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, Nadia. There's lots of um, thank yous in the chat to you from the schools, from the teachers and the students who have been who have joined us today. I would like to thank you. And I'd also like to thank um, our colleagues at ACME and, of course, at the ACTF. And I will just hand back um, to Janine. And um, yes, thank you to everyone. So many people from all around the country. It's great. So um, thank you and very thank much. Thank you to me as well. Thank you. Thanks. Um, back to you, Janine. Thank you, Annabelle and Nadia. That was a great interview. And I learned so much more uh, about the book. And great that we had time for so many questions. I think if you have any desperate questions that you needed answers to, you could email them through to us teachers. And we'll try and get Nadia's help with those ones as well. And Nadia also has a website, um, NadiaWheatley.com, where she has lots of her frequently asked questions. You might find some answers there as well. Uh, so just to wrap up, I want to thank everybody so much for joining us today. It's been a fantastic session. And Nadia, I think everyone wanted to talk to you for hours longer, uh, but we'll need to close there. Um, teachers, we'll send you through a feedback form and we'd love to hear how you found the session today. Um, and for any students that are super interested now in change and continuity in their own communities, uh, we are running the My Place competition again this year and we welcome entries from year one to year eight students if you'd like to send through your creative writing pieces. Uh, you can catch up on the My Place TV series on ABC iView. I know that was one of the questions we did get to today. Um, so uh, you can tune in there. Thank you everybody for joining us and we'll chat to you again soon. Thank you, Nadia. Thanks, Janine.